All righty. So here we have um, some amazing people. I think one of the things I think of when um, ever we whenever I like to start a youth panel, the first thing I like to highlight is that when we share, we share out of resilience. I think that there are a lot of times that we can show up to spaces and folks want to hear kind of uh, a sad story. But before you today, what you have are strong, resilient young people who have contributed to this work. And I want to first thank y'all because I know sometimes we don't thank you enough for taking the time, for taking your time today off of work, off of school, off of what you could have been doing to be here with us to go ahead and share a bit about the experiences that you have had in this work. So first, if we can just give, her, give our young people a round of applause. So this panel is going to echo what we just heard a little bit about, about safe spaces, but from the youth perspective. And as we listen in, what I would like folks to listen deeply about is really to hear what were some of the themes that are aligned, what are some of the differences, because the next panel after that, we're going to go ahead and explore the intersection of those two and a little bit of the tension of those two. So this is not a quiz, but it is a test, OK? I'm, not, I'm just joking. I'm not giving nobody a test. I'm really against test. <laughs> Anyhow, so if folks can go ahead and introduce yourself, and we're going to do this popcorn style, your name, where you're from, and one interesting fact. And I am the type of moderator that I'm like, hey, it's been 30 seconds, OK? <laughs> All right, so we're going to kick it off here, and we're going to go straight down the line. Is that OK? All righty, let's go. <laughs> My name is uh, Michaela Stanyak. I'm from Omaha. And uh, an interesting fact is I travel to Argentina in May. <laughs> Hola, eh, mi nombre es Jazmín. Tengo 18 años. Eh, vivo en Argentina, pero soy de Perú. Y un dato curioso puede ser que me da miedo viajar en avión, pero igual viajo. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> My name is Rebecca, and I am 21. Excuse me. Um, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, and an interesting fact is I learned how to become my own artist through my trauma and care. Hola, soy Yamila. Tengo 29 años. Soy de Argentina y agreso. Eh, y dato curioso que soy mamá de tres niñas hermosas. Hi, my name's Khalil. I'm from Omaha, and something interesting about me is that I am the second person in my family to attend college. Hi, I'm Bobby. I'm from Lincoln, and I, I really do like to crochet, so. <laughs> Hola, buen día, mi nombre es David, eh, soy de Argentina y un dato curioso es que estuve en un hogar desde los seis años. So the first question we want to explore is what are, where are we really satisfying young people's need for safe spaces? Where do you see that coming up in your experiences? And if you could, if you can give a practical example, because the point is to go ahead and have that exchange with folks and learn from those things. There's many partners in the room. So can we kick it off there? And I'm going to point to someone. No, I'm not. Whoever wants to go first. I could help answer that. Um, I think we're beginning to have a better understanding of trauma-informed care and what that means for youth as young as you know three to four years old to aftercare, you know, when you're 21 to 26. And I think that's especially important when dealing with anyone who has had the experiences that we have had. And um, how Kristen mentioned earlier, um, the examples with her children as a parent, how um, you really have to be patient and understanding of the youth that you have in your care and treat them as if they're your own children. Someone else wants to speak to that? Um, 
I think in terms of um, aging out and leaving care, um, that like Project Everlast would be a good start of a safe place where you are interacting with other youth, youth who have similar experiences and share maybe the same stories. Hello, everyone. Um, I think the Normalcy Act that we have recently passed, um, I was not a part of that, but I know that I loved sports when I was in high school. And the fact that I couldn't go out of the state for any um, championships or tournaments um, really kind of hindered my success in sports. I could have gotten you know, scholarships or so on and so forth. And I really think those are safe places created in the community um, outside of um, workers and, and the whole not normal fact that you're in foster care, but um, having a coach that you can go to for guidance, having, um, even if you are in speech, having a speech person um, that can really further you in your life. So, yeah. Um, I definitely agree. I think like everybody that works with us and everybody that, everybody in this room has like our youth's best interest out. like at heart like I really do think everybody is motivated to like make their life better but I do believe that the youth a lot of the youth do understand like what is best for their own personal interest and I feel like sometimes um, the adults kind of you like kind of listen to them but at the same time they also really do try to do what's best for them and sometimes it can conflict with what the youth has and like what the youth believes in themselves so um like i do believe that they do a good job of like noticing when children need to be placed in a better household but that does not always mean that they are placed in like an even better household like sometimes it'll just substitute a problem with another but they definitely do have our best interest at heart and uh they do realize when children need to switch homes and i think with that stuff i feel like they can keep that going and i definitely don't see any problem with that aspect of that. Yo creo que un espacio seguro puede ser eh, en un lugar en donde en algún espacio, en un taller, en alguna actividad eh, conjunta con jóvenes, eh, en donde pueda jugar y pueda estar eh, siendo siendo contenida y escuchada. Eh, Tengo muchos, por suerte, tengo muchos de esos espacios a los que yo elijo ir y puede ser eh, los talleres de doncel en, en donde participé y en un curso que hice de líderes recreativos que ahí me sentí muy contenida y muy escuchada eh, y se, se pudieron hacer valer algunos de mis derechos que fueron muy, vulnerado, muy, muy vulnerados. Bueno, para mí un espacio seguro es eh, la guía, que es eh, mi guía. La verdad que no sé si es lo que responde la pregunta, pero estoy tan emocionada con todo esto que eh, no puedo eh, acomodar mis sentimientos y lo que voy a decir tiene que ver con eso, que, que bueno, eh, voy a empezar con la parte media eh, fea, voy a ser breve. Eh, en serio. <risa> eh, luego de tanto sufrimiento y solo sentir abandono, frustración, el no recibir cariño y abrazos, eh, la guía es mi guía, es mi familia y es mi lugar de pertenencia. Para mí esto es un lugar seguro. Mi casa, aunque no sea un espacio físico o visible, se trata de sentir. Y soy mamá y es muy importante para el corazón sentir. Y la verdad que es algo que me robaron de muy chiquita el sentimiento y es algo que cuesta mucho reconstruirlo y nada, siento que todo esto me está, <risa> nada, es increíble, eh, agradezco mucho a todos, eh, a, nada, no puedo ni hablar porque estoy muy emocionada, no estoy triste, estoy muy emocionada porque puedo sentir que amo a mis hijas y es muy difícil amar a, a tus hijos cuando fuiste hija y, y no tuviste ese, esa contención, ese abrazo de una mamá y que hoy venga una persona desconocida y te diga eh, ¿cómo estás? ¿todo bien? y que te dé un abrazo, te dé un consuelo, creo que es algo muy, es muy loco y la verdad que eh, lo puedo hacer con mis hijas como lo hago con un montón de jóvenes y sé que vengo a dar esto para ustedes y agradezco que me estén dando este lugar 
y creo que uno debe reconocer sus errores para luego transformarlos y Doncel hace eso, eh, y Agreso hace eso conmigo y con todos ustedes hoy acá, eh, nuestro espacio consta de, de ver y reconocer para luego eh, subir escalones y superarse a sí mismo, no superar al otro, superarse a sí mismo para luego ayudar al otro a que se pueda superar y nada, gracias, gracias. Yeah. I think, you know, we had a lot of moments like this one when we were in Argentina because um, regardless of where we were, w the fact that we all came from different places, it is that same um, experience of disconnection that's rooted at the center of that pain. And so when I think about um, this next question, I want to ask folks on this panel about what, what is it that's missing in the healing journey? Because we're all, no matter if we were in Argentina, if we were from Peru, if we were from the States, the truth of the matter is we all started with that one common experience of being disconnected from the family and, and the people who we originally grew up with. So what is required for this healing? What's missing there? Yo creo, uh, creo que es importante en, en estas cuestiones que el acompañamiento, sobre todo en, en el proceso que nosotros estamos transitando, es necesario constantemente que haya una persona que nos guíe, que entienda que eh, ante la falta de familiares hace que uno tenga que rebuscárselas y, y quizás aprender de un modo anormal. Entonces, la búsqueda eh, en conjunto me da más seguridad y esa seguridad genera mejor resultados a, a largo plazo. Yo creo que... Eh, lo que nos faltó y lo que nos falta eh, es eh, la comprensión y la escucha eh, y también que se deje de invisibilizar distintas violencias que, que vivimos porque en realidad o sea, mis siempre se me viene a la mente mis compañeras del hogar que, que es con las que aprendí y es con las que conviví dos años eh, Tuvimos mucho en común y con todas las personas que estamos acá también tenemos mucho en común. Y lo que más tenemos en común con mis compañeras del hogar es que todas hemos pasado por muchas violencias muy fuertes que se hubiesen podido prevenir, ¿no? Eh, hablándolo, eh, escuchándonos y, y conteniéndonos sobre todo. Eh, a mí me, porque eso es antes de poder entrar a un hogar. Eh, y después también la contención es muy importante porque eh, cuando sales del hogar en Argentina a los 18 años el Estado te desampara. Así. Eh, este año egresé de un hogar así que sé qué es lo que se siente que no puedas volver a una casa. Eso. Um, I think it's important to remember that when we're removed from our homes and disconnected from our families, that leaves a big hole in our souls. And um, not only does that leave a hole from that space, but also all of that trauma and abuse that was experienced, as she just touched on. Um, and that connection that we miss is the love, is the trust, and is that safe space that we're looking for. So wherever we are placed going forward, um, that's what we're looking for in that space, is the trust and the connection and the love. And that connection with the peers who understand what you have been through because of their own experiences is what I think is most important. And um, I feel like it's very important to encourage that for individuals who have had these same experiences to step into these professional roles and positions that you all are in so that we can communicate with each other from a basis of understanding. So I understand where you're coming from. When you come to me and say, this is what I'm experiencing, can you help me with this? Can I trust you with my experiences enough to share my trauma with you and ask for your help? Because that's a very vulnerable position that we're coming from. You know, one of the things I appreciate is always um, 
those of us who are a lot of folks, we play different roles within the advocacy movement when you're an alumni. There are a few of us who are willing to be at the forefront to allow ourselves to be vulnerable and share some of the most painful sides of us so that folks in the room who can influence your programs, your policy, the way that you do the work, can think differently about how might we do something different. So I want this next part to be a part where everyone in the room really has their ears open to this the answers to the next questions. So for folks on the panel, if each of you can answer the question, if you can really wave a magic wand and really change one thing about the programs, the services, the systems that we interact with, what would be that one thing that you would say, I wish we could focus on blank? Dale. Arranco, porque si no, no arranco más. Es muy fuerte también. Si tuviera una varita mágica, la verdad que cambiaría muchas cosas, pero lo que hoy se necesita mucho más en Argentina es que el Estado realmente eh, eh, que los jóvenes tengamos los niños eh, en riesgo tengan un asesor porque yo cuento esto y hace tengo 29 años y 20 años atrás más o menos que conoce mi historia el estado tengo somos nueve hermanos y lamentablemente tengo hermanos que siguen viviendo con mis padres y no están en buena situación entonces es como que eh, a mí me cuesta mucho seguir y ver mis logros o poder seguir caminando cuando tengo hermanos que están pasando por una situación muy fea y no poder hacer nada. Entonces, eh, intento ayudar a muchos jóvenes porque tengo mucha gente que me acompaña, pero me encantaría poder ayudar a mis hermanos, pero es una situación muy complicada. Entonces, eh, ver que el Estado no haga nada sabiendo de que están en una situación de riesgo muy peligrosa, eh, donde hay abusos sexuales y violencia y es algo muy feo, y es algo que lo saben y tampoco hacen nada, entonces es como que es muy lento, no digo que no hagan nada, es muy lento, es muy lento y siguen pasando los años y mi varita mágica iría para la cabeza de los que están ahí arriba en el Estado, los jueces y, y que nada, <risa> perdón, <risa> allá es así, <risa> perdón, eso. Gracias por eso. <risa> <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things I wish I could change, but if I had to pick one, I guess like a really good uh, thing I would like to change is like the relationships between the foster parents and the foster children, because I do see like they get together, but it's like in my experience, at least it seemed like there wasn't really like the personal connection that I had. Like it just kind of felt like it was a place for me to stay at for the time being. And um, I'm sure it's like that with other children. And like the thing I would like to change is just like the interaction between them and like kind of like a support system from the foster parents to like help the youth achieve their personal goals, like helping them like give them rides to their jobs or like if they want to do like extracurricular activities or anything like that like I wish they um, put more effort into that type of stuff and um, if I could switch that I just get that going for everybody I don't know if I could switch one thing it would be um, to have authentic compassion for everyone that is involved in a child's life through the system and that that means the judge and the caseworkers and the probation officers and the foster parents and the child themselves and, and the biological child or the biological family of that child because caseworkers that have 40 cases cannot, cannot adequately um, change or help change someone else's life, a child's life. Um, a judge that just doesn't have all the information or a caseworker that is just overloaded and doesn't have the right tools or information for that judge to make the right call or the um, supports for the biological family. If they are um, abusing drugs, they don't have those supports. They would rather take the child out instead of working with the parent to bring that child home. So I would just say compassion and understanding for everyone across the board in that child's life. I think um, that the ability to listen to youth has like grown a lot over the past few years, but 
It's more of we're listening to older youth. We aren't listening to the younger youth that are like just going into it and who are experiencing all these different things and they're in strange places, sometimes separated from siblings. The ability to empathize is not across the board. And I think that's a really big component that once you start showing that you care when they're younger for what they have to say, that they will grow up and be more likely to help improve this system. Um, I'd like to point out that, as it was said earlier, it's such a delicate balance between helping youth understand what's healthy risk taking and what's pushing the boundaries and where you need to be responsible for your actions. And that starts at the core level of care within the homes, within the families, the foster parents who are there with the youth every single day. You know, care workers, judges, uh, probation officers, anybody else, any other practitioner is only with you for about an hour every week or every month. But these people who are with you day in and day out, they can understand more of what you're going through, what you're experiencing, how you're feeling, if the youth feel comfortable enough to talk to them and to feel comfortable enough to talk to them, you have to build that connection and that support and that trust within the homes. Who hasn't gone? Sí, eh, yo. Creo que también la parte de un espacio de jóvenes que ya transitaron por la misma situación, que quién es mejores que ellos para entender qué es lo, las falencias que existen y a partir de eso construir mejores eh, medidas, mejores herramientas y que eso a su vez sea como una crítica constructiva constante y que el chico que siga afrontando esa situación y va creciendo pueda permitir a otros que se mejore el sistema en sí. Thank you. Who hasn't gone? We're good. Did we hit everyone? Alrighty. I want to point out something, which is that every single one of these answers had to do with a mindset, something that required no dollars. We heard about mindsets, personal connection, authentic compassion, listening, coaching, trust, show up, right? And so as you think about how do we make today meaningful, how is it worth the free meal that we got, <laughs> the time people showed up to put this together, the logistics, the time people sacrificed to be here, it's all worth it if we can take what we just heard and start to think about how do I show up in my work tomorrow, right after this, next week and next month, applying those lessons that we just heard. So we're gonna switch to Q&A, but I wanna go ahead and put some rules of engagement. So I would love for folks to ask questions to seek clarity, questions around curiosities um, that are too deep into a personal experience, sometimes cross the line. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna say I have the right to veto questions, okay? <laughs> But for the most part, we're not going to have that problem. So I want folks to be able to ask what they want to ask. Um, but I also want it to be, we share our experience in, with the objective of being able to move some type of needle, right? Um, so Lincoln's going to run around. But Lincoln, you have to run <laughs> to questions. <laughs> and then a question is a question. And then for some comments. I'm going to save two minutes at the end just to hear a popcorn comments, and it will be 30 seconds, because we always get folks who want to share comments. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and just allow a little bit of space for that. But let's go with questions. Questions, questions. Buenas tardes, y gracias por acompañarnos ahora y compartir sus historias. Uh, mi pregunta es, ¿cómo nosotros como comunidad, no como agencias, cómo podemos apoyarlos a ustedes a ingresar en la comunidad y darles lo que necesitan para lograr sus metas? Uh, no como agencia, pero como comunidad. Y especialmente para los jóvenes latinos, que aquí en la comunidad de nosotros está incrementando la cantidad de jóvenes latinos que están en el, en el sistema. Me parece eh, que otra vez con la escucha y con la palabra y con oportunidades, eh, ya sea oportunidades de, de trabajo, oportunidades de vivienda, eh, con oportunidades eh, me, me parece que la comunidad ayuda un montón porque muchas veces somos excluidos por color, por, 
por sexualidad, hay un montón de, de, de maneras de excluirnos y, y bueno, eh, me parece que esa sería la respuesta. Gracias. Someone else have a quick answer to that? Um, I'd like to say that um, it's important to give the control back to the youth, as was said earlier. Um, we are transitioning out of care, out of youthhood into adulthood. And it's important for us to find ourselves and to become our own person. And when we were younger going through care, a lot of that control has been taken away. And so giving that back to us allows us to find ourselves, giving that control to us to make our mistakes and learn from them and grow from them, just like all of you have had experiences with. It, it can definitely help within those communities. Thank you. As we run to the next question, one of the things I want to highlight is also the importance that costs nothing but the ability to stay connected to our culture. You know, as a Puerto Rican, it's some of my Spanish sometimes goes away <laughs> and it comes back. Um, but it's the ability to stay connected to that cultural, um, those cultural experiences that help us understand who we are and that costs no money. And that's even if it's one day. Eat, learning how to cook, I still have not figured out the beans part of the rice and beans. I got the yellow rice down. I got to learn the other side. So as you um, take, I'm sorry, I'm Leonard Burden. I'm with the Center for the Study of Social Policy. Um, so as you um, go through these healthy uh, risks and, and take risks, how, how, how and when do you want adult support to engage with you? Oh. <laughs> First, um, <laughs> creating a dialogue between um, the adults and the youth that um, set boundaries but also give a little flexibility so that the youth understands, hey, I do have the choice to make this decision. Um, however, I know that these are the consequences that are coming afterwards. Um, whether they be good consequences or bad consequences, and just opening that dialogue up a little further for discussion of what did you learn from those consequences or what did you learn from that experience, and how can I help you going forward to uh, apply that learning to any situation that you experience in the future? Um, I was kind of going to say what... Um, what she already said, but I was thinking that like communication definitely is key. Like, l like if you were a youth attempting to take a risk, I would communicate with an adult and just like let them know like I am taking this risk. But it's also important to be educated on what, like what the uh, risks of taking, the, or obviously what the risks are. But um, sometimes the benefits can outweigh the risks, and if you do succeed, then it can be great. But I do think. The best way to approach that is to just communicate and be educated on what the risks really are and like how it can affect your life and if you're willing to take that. So I would love to follow that up. If we can get like uh, an example of a supportive adult in your life who helped you during a risky opportunity. For example, like the first time I saw some, like some healthy drinking was like at a foster care event. I was like, oh, you have two. And then the staff person says, you never go beyond two because there'll be a situation where you'll be in HR. That was a rule that I then learned that day. You know, I figured out two and a half is the best and I'll play. So if you could give a practical example of a moment where, you know, it's a little bit of a risk taking, but some type of supportive adult, a staff person, someone in your life um, supported you in that kind of way. Don't get nobody in trouble. No. <laughs> uh, then never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can share it. Just don't use no names. Okay. <laughs> it's a little too like specific. So oh, okay, got you. Okay. We know how to pass here. <laughs> Any other a, examples? I can give a good example. Um, my work through Jim Casey and the Annie Casey Foundation. I'm one of our um, adult leaders. Her name is Sandra, and um, her. Her and Catherine and Paula and um, all of them have this great thing they like to call the library. When we go on our um, advocacy trips in the evenings, they encourage us to go out and explore the library. Generally, that means the place we are. Obviously, um, 
she encourages that healthy risk taking, going out and exploring and having fun with each other and getting to know each other. Um, but also, in a half jokingly but half serious way, um, she reminds us that you know you have to do it in a way to where you protect yourself, you keep yourself safe, you're responsible. Referring to the library um, can be anything that we choose to do that evening. You know, we could decide to go and um, have dinner together, or go to a party, or just have some drinks on the beach. But as long as we're responsible in what we do, that's all that matters. Thank you. So we're gonna go to the, mm -hmm. oh, do we have one more? Well, I was gonna say, um, so as, as we all know, some youth do not like to be responsible. I mean, um, you can give them the option to take that risk healthily and then not. Um, and if they decide to take that risk, I think it really starts with that, um, that trust that you have unconditional support, whether it's if you go out and drink and you drink too much, yes, you're gonna have consequences, but I will unconditionally love and support you, um, and I will always be there. You can call me. I may have some words to say to you afterwards, but, um, and that, that's with a social worker who, who is kind of breaking that boundary of professionalism um, versus personal, um, but if they give you their number to, to call or any situation, I, I got into a fight or I missed curfew or I wanna run away or I drank too much or I went, you know, I went to a party, I broke the rules, um, that unconditional love is, is very important in trust building. Ask. It'll be quick. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think what most youth look for in the adults um, that they are engaging these healthy relationships with is the type of person who, when you say you're going to go do something, they don't tell you not to do it. They, they'll say, be safe or be careful or don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs> so. So as we get our next question going, one of the things I want to point out, so someone needs to raise their hand so that Doug can run. So as we get to the next question, one thing I want to point out is that sometimes we forget that healthy risk taking, there means that there's two results, right? There's like, you can't say, I'm going to give you a healthy risk taking opportunity and I expect you to win every time. There has to be a moment where you're going to have a learning lesson. So any other questions? I'll ask a question. Uh, oh, I was like, who's that? <laughs> I ran so fast you didn't see it. <laughs> what, I mean, what are you most looking forward to? I mean, we've talked a lot about past, past experiences. What are you looking forward to in your future? And how do you hope to get there? Bueno, sí. Eh, en mi caso busco desde el espacio que tenemos que es la guía E y que se habló bastante de, de tratar de transmitir esto de lo que nosotros pasamos a otros chicos y de generar mayores herramientas para que puedan ser más independientes es como a veces siento como que es una situación un poquito distinta a la que sucede acá eh, que en realidad la, las personas que están transitando esto necesitan de alguien que confíe en alguien que le pueda dar más ánimos y de la confianza en sí de, yo puedo hacerlo, necesito simplemente que estén acá, que me digan por dónde hay que caminar, déjame ese, ese espacio, yo lo voy a hacer. Y como no lo hay, como no existe ese referente, esa persona que te ayude, eh, tratamos en lo posible nosotros de, de estar ahí a través de nuestra experiencia. Y en lo personal, si pudiera ese mensaje replicarse hacia otras personas que también entiendan que hay otras situaciones distintas a las nuestras y que deberíamos, más allá de nuestro camino, proyecto, lo que sea, mirar un poco al costado sería la mejor, la mejor manera de, de decir que estamos haciendo las cosas bien. Si I could take a moment. I never saw myself here. I never saw myself on a panel. I never saw myself in college or even graduating high school. So all the opportunities that are coming at me from, um, from Nebraska children, from Jim Casey, from any of this, um, is because of my experience in care and because of my choice to use that experience to advocate for the youth of the future. And um, I'm really looking forward to continuing to watch myself grow and see my own, um, 
just all the opportunities that are there for me that I never even dreamed of. And then also using those opportunities to work with you guys and any youth who I can help as a result of that. I think, oh, I'm sorry. No I think um, what I'm looking forward to in the future um, is seeing less and less kids fall through the cracks after they age out um, and going and being 30 and saying, man, if I just would have had this and this and this as a support system when I was 19, getting out instead of just dropping off of an edge, um, I would have been fine by now. And um, I really think they can, they can change that by using this um, Bring Up Nebraska, uh, Nebraska initiative um, by using all these agencies to just collaborate with each other and, and resources that people can, oh, well, you're in LEAP. Um, do you know about Project Everlast? And that's what I think is the best thing to <laughs> No, I, uh, this is all great feedback. One of the things I want to do before we leave is just make sure I give you uh, a last 30 seconds of, does any, any of you have just one thing that's on your mind, unrelated to the questions, unrelated to everything that's been asked, one thing that you would just like to express? Okay. Um, uh, so yesterday, um, we were all um, doing some activities, and we brought up that a lot of um, young foster children are kind of ashamed of being in foster care. And like at like Camp Catch Up, they didn't realize that all the other kids there were also in foster care. They were they were keeping it very secretive, and um, we had done like the old story and this is what we wanted to be the new story and we had thought about maybe if we could um, organize a group that's more like a like a big brother big sister thing but like strictly for younger kids in the system so that they can create healthy relationships with people who share similar stories I don't know why I just told you all that but it's been on my mind this whole time <laughs> Any last comments before I transition out? Khalil? Okay, one, oh. two, three. Right. So I'm gonna go Khalil, Davi, sí. and then we'll go, yes. Okay. Me first? Yes. yes. Okay, um, what I was just gonna say is like, we're all in this room today because we all understand there are issues at hand, but we're all working towards them, trying to change things, and I do believe that is a mindset you have to have, just to like know that things can get better and you can flip things around, and um, that we, I lost my train of thought, but we all are working towards a better life and everybody should know that it's, it's hard work and you just have to have a goal in mind and you may not reach your goal, but if you are aiming towards a goal, you will get further and get closer than you were when you started out. And um, I just definitely think that's something to keep in mind on this really long journey that we're all taking. Thank you for making a short, quick little point. See. Eh, en lo personal me doy cuenta que a partir de toda la historia vivida, de haber estado en un hogar y haber crecido, haber estudiado, encontrar trabajo, sé que tuve gente que pudo ayudarme y e inconscientemente toda esa ayuda hoy se refleja en que yo quiero ayudar a otra persona, quiero, eh, no me es ser feliz solamente si veo que el de al lado no la está pasando bien. O sea, si estoy en un hogar y siento que soy el único que pudo ingresar a una facultad, me gustaría que todos pudieran hacerlo. Entonces, ese mensaje que me transmitieron a mí, seguramente, si yo lo hago, creo que podría despertar en otros la, la misma, el mismo reflejo. Gracias. Bueno, oh, gracias a ti. <risa> eh, bueno, algo que se me viene a mí a, ahora a la cabeza es... Eh, por ejemplo, durante mucho tiempo eh, luché por tener eh, lo que significa mucho, o sea, mucho para muchos es la casa. Eh, tengo mi casa, me la compré y me di cuenta que en realidad no me hacía tan feliz. <ríe> Creo que todo después de, de tantas cosas que pasamos, eh, algo que es muy importante para todos los que pasamos por eso es la salud mental. Eh, todo pasa por acá y si esto lo tenemos oscuro, no podemos dar nada ni brillar y la verdad que a mí me gusta brillar y tengo tres brillos hermosos que son mis hijas, que las amo y a veces ni siquiera puedo eh, brillar con ellas y 
nada, me encantaría poder remarcar eso, que no siempre lo, lo material ayuda, pero no siempre es lo fundamental eh, cuando pasamos por estas cosas y <ríe> gracias, gracias a todos. Gracias. Se me vienen tres cosas a la mente o quizás un montón. Eh, <risa> primero es eh, agradecerles por estar acá y por escucharnos y por tomarse el tiempo y por comprometerse eh, al hacer este intercambio y al hacer este almuerzo. Eh, se, me, se me viene a la, a la mente la confianza. Que tengan confianza en nosotros, en nosotras, que hemos estado... Eh, sin cuidados parentales por un buen tiempo, pero que realmente tenemos mucho poder y mucha luz dentro de nuestro, que realmente podemos, porque si hemos egresado de un hogar, si hemos podido estar ahí, creo que podemos con todo ir a la universidad, trabajar, enfrentarnos con un montón de cosas, porque realmente es duro estar sin una mamá o sin un papá quien te guíe, como, o quizás una familia tradicional o un adulto responsable, más allá de una mamá y un papá, que es algo tradicional, que no estoy tan de acuerdo, pero eh, otra cosa que se me viene a la mente es que eh, de, desde su lugar, desde cada uno, desde cada una que está acá, eh, si acompañan, no sé, si dan un abrazo, yo creo que con un abrazo, con una escucha, con algo, somos muy felices porque, no sé, yo estaba cuando estaba en la primaria, en la secundaria, y cuando alguien me escuchaba realmente y sentía que eso, eh, es, que yo estaba siendo escuchada, realmente me, me sanaba un montón y el abrazo también. Eh, yo tuve la suerte de estar acompañada y estoy acompañada por muchas personas, muchas chicas que me acompañaron al ingresar al hogar y después al egresar del hogar. Tuve esa gran suerte y ese, esa gran luz que me, que me pudo acompañar. Eh, me siento muy feliz y por eso tengo esta voz y por eso estoy acá hablando y, y hablar y hablar y puedo hablar un montón porque soy fuerte, realmente me siento fuerte, pero eh, nada, eso, que les agradezco un montón. So, I want to wrap up this piano um, by saying one, thank you so much. I know how difficult it is to put ourselves in a place where we show up, we share some of the most um, painful experiences in our current pain um, and allow ourselves to be vulnerable um, in efforts for others to learn. So I want to thank you all for taking not only the time, sacrificing time that you could have been doing other things, but being present to us here. I want to read something real quick, wrap this panel up by reading something real quick that I read on Instagram that really hit this, I was on Instagram earlier during lunch. Um, and I just thought to myself, wow, it's, it, it relates to the moment here, which it says that grapes must be crushed to make wine. Diamonds form under pressure. Olives are pressed to release oil. Seeds grow in darkness. Whenever you feel crushed, under pressure, pressed, or in darkness, You're in a powerful place of transformation. And when I think about our role in that transformation and every young person that we serve, we can contribute to that transformation. It does not matter how dark yesterday was, today we're in your office, today we're working with you in your space, and it is an opportunity to transform into who we want to become. So thank you all for listening.